Professor Direk Ladi uh, did agree to debate with me today on the issue of immunity, I couldn't help but uh, imagine my uh, childhood when, uh, as a growing, uh, when I was growing up as a boy. We used to be, some of you probably who have, uh, you know, who grew up in the wood may relate to this story. We used to be involved in certain fights where you'd be paired by certain uh, uh, people to fight. And uh, once in a while, sometimes you would be paired by someone who is not only stronger or bigger, but maybe even older. In those circumstances, those who would pay you uh, would make sure that they exercise what they will call a duty of care. If they see too much blows coming away, <laughs> they, would, uh, they would stop the fight. So at this point in time, I think I would uh, remind Professor Fiona and everyone here that you owe me a duty of care <laughs> in the event that you find a uh, prop directly here. Uh, throwing too much at you, know, you have to intervene. By way of introduction, I would start by wanting to mention that you know, it is common cause to most of lawyers or people who are studying law to say that there are a number of immunities which exist in international law, be it a head of state immunity, be it diplomatic immunity as governed by the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, be it uh, immunities which are granted to uh, uh, people who are attending special conferences, etc. These immunities, so to say, uh, there, there are certain conditions which one needs to satisfy before those immunities can be granted to you. And for example, I'll start by mentioning that in this particular case, uh, contrary to some of the suggestions which have been suggested by certain commentators, uh, the Vienna Conventions on Diplomatic uh, Relations, for example, which deals with diplomatic immunity, is not applicable in the uh, current case. Why? Because it deals with immunities of diplomats who are ordinarily based in a foreign country, which is not the case. So I'm not going to be talking about that, which other people have been refer referring to provisions under the Vienna Convention of Diplomatic Relations. Now, now that I have mentioned the fact that actually immunities are different, or there are different kinds of immunities under international law, it is surprises me that politicians even legal minds who have been involved in this case, there's been some sort of conflation as to which kind of immunity is being granted to Grace Mugabe. In the same statement that the uh, Department of uh, International Relations and Cooperation, DICO, as, as well as uh, the government of Zimbabwe, they mentioned the issue of diplomatic immunity. In the same breath, they mentioned the issue of uh, uh, head of state immunity. It's not clear which immunity actually was granted to Grace Mugabe. That at one point, it appears as if it is a machine gun approach <coughs> where someone is firing everywhere and at everything in the hope that in the process, maybe one may hit the target. One may say that it is as if the government of South Africa and the government of Zimbabwe went on a fishing expedition for immunities. Unfortunately, all they are catching from the immunities, what, immunity waters are frogs. And the reason why I will explain frogs, <laughs> the, 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 the reason why I, I, I'm saying this is I will discuss my argument by supporting it by, uh, broadly by three points. Firstly, I asked the question, I considered the question whether Grace Mugabe was or is entitled to immunity in her own right by virtue of her attending the SADC uh, summit as claimed by the government of Zimbabwe and also is corroborated by uh, DICO. I also considered the question, secondly, whether her immunity is derivative, so to say, by virtue of her being wife of the president of Zimbabwe, thereby being entitled to uh, head of immunity, uh, head of state immunities as provided for under customary international law. Lastly, I will address the question or the issue of the place of international committee, uh, especially where there are other compelling national and international obligations on the government of South Africa. Now, before I go to address these three basic points which I have mentioned, I would start by wanting to give some sort of a background on Grace Mugabe so that most of us, we may know her just as the first lady of Zimbabwe, but who exactly is Grace Mugabe? I will start by a point which has been said by a man called Wama Gaisa, a lawyer from Zimbabwe. He says, and I'm quoting him verbatim, she is, referring to Grace Mugabe, used to getting what she wants whenever she wants it. If there is someone standing between her and your target, the person must give way. If there is a law prohibiting it, it is no more than a minor <coughs> inconvenience. 
And in this regard, there are actually four points or four examples which I can cite to show that Grace Mugabe from the point go is not a person for respecting the law. For example, in Mazowe, where she owns a farm, before she was owning that farm, there were villagers who were staying at that farm. But because she wanted it, it didn't matter that that farm was occupied. She had the villagers evicted. Not only were they left homeless, most of them were left by the road without any shelter. When she wanted to buy a special ring, a special rock from Dubai, and the laws of Zimbabwe, especially those of the Central Bank, wouldn't allow it, she only didn't arm twist the Reserve Bank of uh, uh, the Reserve Bank Governor of Zimbabwe to make sure that that process went through. Again, she was there to get what she wanted. Even in the academia, most of us since we were at the university here. <laughs> in 2014, when her rival, Dr. Joyce Mjure, the former vice president, was about to graduate with the end PhD at the University of Zimbabwe, she, em she emerged, as Wama Gwaisa would say, from the academic wilderness to claim a PhD <laughs> at the same time, <laughs> irrespective that she has not actually studied uh, for that particular degree. It is even a shame that the South African government in its documents has been actually referring to her as Dr. Grace Mungad. Now, lastly, which is the most important point which we are here to discuss today about public uh, verbal and physical attacks on others. This is not the first time Grace Mungad is doing it. In Zimbabwe, she's practically known for calling Senior members of, uh, of, of, of a party, for example, even just two days ago, the vice president of our country was called like a child before the public and, and, and dressed before, the, before, before everyone. As, a, as, a, as of physical uh, attacks, in 2009, she was involved in a very similar circumstance where she was there to attack a photographer in Asia, again claiming immunity. So when she came to South Africa and attacking this young lady, Gabriela Angels, it can be foreseeable that she knew that nothing probably would happen to her. She would just have to claim immunity. But the fundamental question in this regard is, does, is she entitled that immunity under international law? Now, as Pewama Gaisa, she is says in short, in, as in conclusion, Grace Mugabe uses her power to harass and get her way in Zimbabwe, and she is guaranteed to get it. That is the life of grace. Nothing stands in her way. She is used to getting her way every single time. But when she came to South Africa and this happened, other lawyers, myself included, we thought the South African government probably was going to do the right thing and not extend immunity to an individual who doesn't uh, qualify for them. And this is the re these are my reasons why I say she didn't qualify for immunity. Before I do that though, it is maybe important to just give a reframe of the brief facts of what happened between the 13th and the 20th of August. <laughs> On the 13th of August, Grace Mugabe was reported to be in South Africa, specifically for medical attention, not attending the uh, summit as claimed. 14th of August, there were reports of the allegations that Grace Mugabe had uh, actually attacked Gabriela Angels on the 13th of August. On the 14th of August, surprisingly, the Department of International Relations and Cooperation spokesperson, Clayson Moniela, said that Mrs. Mugabe would not be receiving diplomatic immunity. 15th of August, Mrs. Mugabe was scheduled for a court hearing to record a statement but failed to appear in full content. The 16th of August, that's when the government of Zimbabwe sent a note verbal to DECO invoking diplomatic immunity for Grace Mugabe. On the 17th of August, Police Minister Fikile Mbalula uh, said that the police had put a red alert at the South African borders for Zimbabwean first lady Grace Mugabe in case she attempted to leave the country. 20th of August, there came the surprise. DECO granted diplomatic immunity to Grace Mugabe. And in their reasons, as they've been referred to by Prof. Franz Fillon, they say that they had considered international law, they had considered that there was uh, the SADC summit, they had considered the relations between uh, Zimbabwe and other Southern African countries. As such, they said Grace Mugabe was entitled to immunity. Now, I come to the three basic points why I say Grace Mugabe didn't qualify for immunity. And I'm looking forward actually to hear what Prof. Uh, uh, Directly, will respond to, to these arguments. 
Now, the minister said that he exercised his discretion in terms of Section 2 of the South African Diplomatic and Privileges Act. And the point which I want to emphasize from the point go is to say that that discretion must and should be exercised within the confines of law. Now, if we are to consider the first point, whether Grace Mugabe was entitled to immunity in her own right because of the claimed attendance of the 37th SADC Summit of Heads of State and Government, my question, which I want to agree with uh, Prof. Ladd, is to say yes, in the first place, it is possible that a wife of a head of state can act in her own right as a representative of the state, and as such, if that is the case, immunities available to her may be extended uh, in accordance with specific regulations or specific treaties that are applicable. And I refer this to the case of Qatar versus Brahem. Now, the question is, what is the specific treaty relevant to this uh, particular case in, uh, in, in point? Grace Mugabe said she was here to attend the SADC summit. And in terms of the Southern African Development Community Protocol on Immunities and Privileges <coughs> of 1992, in particular Article 6, Subsection 2, this protocol which I'm referring to was signed not only by Zimbabwe, by Robert Mugabe, the husband himself, and was uh, ratified by the government of Zimbabwe. And in Article 6.2, it provides specifically as follows. Privileges, immunities, and facilities are, are accorded to the representatives of member states, not for personal benefit of the individual's consent, but in order to safeguard the independent exercise of their functions in connection with the subject. Consequently, a member state not only has the right, but is under obligation <coughs> and a duty to waive the immunity of its representatives in any case where, in the opinion of the member state, the immunity would impede, would impede the course of justice. Now, is there any doubt that this particular instance Grace Mugabe, the immunity that was forwarded or that was uh, uh, conferred to Grace Mugabe was for her own personal benefit, and it is in fact defeated the cause of justice. There was an obligation on Zimbabwe to waive actually that immunity. Now, Professor Hadi may argue to say, well, this government of South Africa, or South Africa, so to say, is not part to SADC, it is not acceded to SADC, which is uh, an argument someone may listen to. But however, that is uh, a non consensual argument because if Zimbabwe had an obligation to waive the immunity in this particular case, it means South Africa could not recognize something which, is, which does not exist in international law in the first place. For that reason, even if one considers that uh, the government of South Africa did not accede to this protocol, one would note that South Africa is part to the OAU Convention on the Pri Privileges and Immunities of, of the OAU, whose Article 5, subsection 4, is similar in substance to Article 6.2 of the SAID protocol. And in fact, the SADC uh, governments actually took verbatim that provision from the OAU provisions, which means the government of South Africa is aware actually of that obligation that where these immunities are not meant actually to be abused, they are not meant to cover people who come with the uh, intention or who be committing crimes in a particular country. Now, let's assume now the second argument. To say, is Grace Mugabe, after all, entitled to immunity, as, uh, a deri uh, uh, to derivative immunity, so, so to say, by virtue of her being wife to, to the president of Zimbabwe? Now, I will start by stating that, you know, yet of state immunity is governed by customary international law. That is the fact. And yes, under customary international law, heads of states are inviolable, both for official and private acts. I agree with that, as per the arrest warrant case. But immunity, as I have said, is not a carte blanche, uh, you know, to say head of state can go ahead and commit crimes. But the fundamental question, how I'm phrasing this debate, the fundamental question in this regard is whether customary international law provides for immunity that covers private acts of a spouse of a head of state who is traveling, not in the company of the head of state. My answer to that is no. The reason I say that is because customary international law is made of state practice and opinion use. That's common cause. 
is state practice in this regard consistent? That spouses can actually get the head of state, you mean, uh, can, uh, get the head of state you mean by virtue of them being wives. You would find that they are actually, state practice is, 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 is not consistent. It's uneven. There are cases on one end where wives have been granted that immunity. There are cases where they have not been granted that immunity. Now, which means because state practice is not consistent, it's not customary in the national law. This is the reason why you find, say, Arthur Watts, for example, I know he's a scholar and I'll cite some, some, some also provisions from the International Law Commission Special Rapporteur. He says that if members of the family of a head of state make private visits abroad, not in the company of the head of state, it is doubtful that international law provides them immunities and privileges. That is on page 8 of the heads of state, heads of government, foreign, uh, uh, foreign ministers, his, in his article. And the same thing is said by the International Law Commission Special Rapport. Well, this was in 1989, as back as 1989, where he said, families' enjoyment of immunities and privileges is a matter of international comity rather than established rules of international law. Further, to the same effect, the United Nations Secretariat Memorandum concerning immunity of state officials from foreign criminal jurisdiction at para paragraph 116, they state that, the granting of immunity rational personnel, the one which President Mugabe is uh, being considered under international law, to the family members and members of the entourage of a head of state remains an uncertain matter. Neither family <coughs> members nor members of suit of head of state benefit from immunity before the authorities of foreign state unless afforded as such as a matter of committee. And this has been repeated also in various uh, 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 reports, for example, the 2008 by the Special Rapporteur of the International Law Commission, <coughs> to which Prof. Ladd is a member. It states that, uh, you know, it's a matter <laughs> of uh, comedy, it's not international law. Now, if one now agrees that there is uncertainty in as far as this issue is concerned, that state practice is inconsistent, and you have a treaty which is clear-cut on how immunities should function, in particular the SADC, protocol which I have mentioned uh, prior, the, 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 the regard must be had to that protocol, which actually states to say that immunities shouldn't be granted for the personal benefit, especially if it defends the cause of justice. Looking uh, at my time, I'm trying to rush to my, to my, to my uh, last argument, but to say that there is a reason why I'm saying that it, it can't be possible that a, 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 a a first lady who's in a uh, private, uh, who's uh, traveling with, not in the company of the head of state, shouldn't be granted immunity because immunity for head of state, there is a rationale, three actual principles why they have, they enjoy that immunity. For example, there's the concept of symbolic sovereignty, where to say the head of state is said to be symbolizing the state itself, though that concept actually has been, you know, diluted with years. Many scholars agree to that. For example, previously when the issues of immunity status of, of the head of state, there was this consideration where you find uh, uh, the, the likes, for example, of Louis XIV as back, as, as back then saying, uh, uh, later sema, to mean the state is me. Or you find the like of Louis XVI saying, say legal pasca je le souhaite, to mean the thing is legal because I wish it. But gone are those days. The issue of sovereignty is now exercised in the interest of protecting the people of Zimbabwe. Uh, the, the, the people uh, ahead of state represents, so to say. And the principle also of uh, non-intervention, to say states are equal. So the reason why you wouldn't want to submit a, a, a head of state before the jurisdiction of a foreign state is to say you can't do that to another state. And lastly, which is the most important point, they say the reason for head of state immunity is to ensure proper functioning of interstate relations. So if you were to imprison a head of state, you are going to impede that. Do, 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 do those reasons actually apply to a wife of, 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 a, of a president? I don't think so. The state will not stop functioning because Grace Mugabe is being charged for a crime which is committed or she's being tried for that. I, I, I don't think so. So if there is inconsistent practice, I then re-emphasize that point. Guidance should have been had from the directly applicable treaty, the SADC protocol, which in the present circumstances would not have allowed Grace Mugabe immunity. My last point, sorry for, for going over the five minutes, is the issue of what is the place of international comedy? Because the DECO actually mentioned in its, uh, in its, uh, in its uh, reasoning to say we want to maintain good relations, which is an issue of international comedy. 
what is the place of international community in international law, especially where there is a chance that it may conflict with other important obligations? The case of Hilton versus Guillot, it stated as follows. Committee, in the legal sense, is neither a matter of absolute obligation on the state, it is mere cates and goodwill upon the other. The case of Lewis uh, Locks versus Standard Oil Company also said the committee is a misleading word that has been responsible for much of the trouble. It has been fatal in suggesting a discretion that is unregulated by general principles. A discretion which I have referred earlier to say that the minister when he say she was exercising her discretion, actually that was not governed, that was not grounded in, uh, in, in law, so to say. Now because we have the right to remedy, which is protected in the South African constitution and which has been recognized under international law, South Africa was actually supposed to give more weight to that uh, obligation because there is an authority on the, on the issue of whether Grace Mugabe was entitled to immunity under custom international, but there's clarity that she didn't deserve that uh, uh, immunity under the SADC protocol. Now, the international law, also international law has recognized that when you are talking of the right to remedy, the right to remedy includes prosecution of the offender. In this particular case, it needed uh, Grace Mugabe to be subjected to the courts of uh, South Africa, so to say. In conclusion, I have seen some of the arguments which people have been making, probably Prof. Thad will make the same, to say, uh, why, 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 what would you expect the government of South Africa to do when uh, Robert Mugabe was here? You know, it was uh, an impossible case. The, the issue is always to paint a situation of impossibility that if something uh, actually, or if Grace Mugabe was to be arrested, heavens were going to fall. In this very same room, I remember my friend Victor Ayane. His argument was that in 2011, in this same room when I was debating him, he said, most of the times international lawyers, when they are asked to do something right, to do something which is just, they always want to paint a picture that heavens will fall, international law will collapse. But in most cases, when the right thing has been done, heavens never fell. The Kenyan, uh, the Kenyan court's decision, for example, albeit on a different issue, would be a good example, where the right thing can be done without actually uh, the, 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 the alarmist thing of saying, you know, things will, will, will fall apart, uh, we'll say. With that, I'll conclude with his statement, Professor Diretlade. In one of his presentations, he has asked the question, is South Africa becoming a rogue state? That is this question when someone, one of the titled video in which he talks about immunities. I am afraid at this rate, it will soon be. I think that will be my last statement. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we, um, our colleague Victor Ayeni, unfortunately, is in uh, Nigeria at the moment, but I'm sure that uh, we will remember his words. But let us give the word now to someone who is here, although some words were already put in your mouth. <laughs> Perhaps you can clarify the issues. Thank you. There is a duty on Zimbabwe, you argue, to waive immunity. So we can go to Zimbabwe and say, you have to waive immunity. The duty to waive is not self-executing. There is no principle in law that says because a state is under a duty to say to, to, to waive immunity, then the other state, um, which is obliged to respect that immunity, can assume that that immunity doesn't exist. Waiver of immunity has to be expressly waived, number one, and it can only be waived, it can only be waived by the state entitled to it. That said, as I'll try to show it really doesn't matter. So all these arguments about the, you know, the SADC protocol um, um, and, um, and the way you convention really don't go to the heart of the matter. Let me make one more point, which, which I should actually make later on, but I suspect I will forget. So let me just make it now. Um, you mentioned, and this is really the main argument, on the derivative immunity of the spouse of a head of state. You mentioned you prefaced your remarks by saying, that custom international law is made by state practice and opinion use. And then he went on to say that state practice is inconsistent. But you didn't refer to a single act of state practice. You referred to what? That's not practice. Right? You didn't refer to a single state practice. You referred to the, the memorandum of the SG. That's not state practice. So I'll try to show you some state practice. And I think it's also important 
as we sort of think about that particular, uh, that particular type of immunity, uh, to think about its scope as well. I think in your, your remarks, you sort of, at one point, you seem to be accepting that there is such an immunity, but you were limiting it to when the spouse is traveling with the head of state. At other times, you seem to be suggesting that it doesn't exist at all. So I'm not really sure which one you're arguing. I think if you're arguing the former, that it does exist, but only when the spouse is traveling with the head of state, then I think you're absolutely right. I mean, at least my position as a lawyer is that, um, that uh, a spouse traveling without the head of state or the Minister for Foreign Affairs, for that matter, um, would not be entitled to that derivative immunity if they're not traveling with the official, right? So the question then in this case, if you accept that, is how does this apply in this current scenario? Because she came here without traveling with him, so she came here alone, but subsequently she arrived. The answer to that question, I think, goes to what we mean by immunity and inviolability, right? Question on this particular type of immunity is, is, is there something derivative from it attaching to the spouse of a head of state? Um, the answer is a qualified yes. And on this, there is no inconsistency, none whatsoever. The answer is that there is absolutely, absolutely derivative immunity of a head of state protecting the spouse if the spouse is traveling with the head of state. Okay? No inconsistency as far as practice is concerned. UK legislation, Australian legislation, because this is, this is what we mean when we say practice, right? When we're talking about practice, we're talking about legislation. So UK legislation, Australian legislation, um, uh, Swiss legislation, um, domestic court cases, it's practice, right? You mentioned Grace Mugabe and the Hong Kong issue. There was a court decision, that's practice, yes? The Swiss federal court went as far as to say custom international law has always recognized. The only, the only inconsistency with respect to this particular rule, the only inconsistency with this particular rule, is whether or not it applies to, to, uh, to spouses only, or it applies broader to the immediate family. And of course, that, that is actually immaterial for this, because here we're looking at the, at the spouse. But for spouses, there is not a single case, element of practice, which denies a spouse traveling with a head of state immunity. Not one that I found. Right? Okay, now I'd be happy um, if you could point to it, if you have it. Um, so the question is, what does that mean in this instance? because Grace Mugabe was not when the incident occurred. And maybe this also goes to this question of can immunity be granted retrospectively and so on. I think those questions are, 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 are um, misunderstand the nature of immunity. They misunderstand the nature of immunity. Because what immunity means, it's not a substantive defense. And so it doesn't matter whether or not you were immune at the time of the offense. Immunity says, because you have immunity at this moment, you are inviolable, you can't be arrested. So even if there was no immunity retrospective, it doesn't matter. Even if at the time she committed the, the offense, she didn't have immunity because she was not traveling, it doesn't matter. If from this moment, she has immunity. That's ultimately the critical question. All of that said, the minister did not make a decision based on that conception. It is something that she took into account. And so she took into account that under custom international law, there is this principle. But she didn't make her decision based on that. She didn't make her decision based on that. Um, and by the way, she, she didn't grant diplomatic immunity. She granted or she conferred immunity or recognized uh, existing immunity. She made her decision based on Section 7.2. What does Section 7.2 say? Section 7.2 says if you're a minister for foreign affairs, in this instance, the, the minister for international relations and cooperation, Right. You have a discretion to confer on, and it says, any person or any organization immunities if it is in the interest of the Republic of South Africa. If it is in the interest of the Republic of South Africa. That is the jurisdictional 
criteria or qualifier? Is it in the view, in the discretion of the decision maker, in the interest of the Republic of South Africa to confer that immunity? Right? You might not agree with, with her assessment of the relevant facts. You might say, well, it is, I don't think it is in the interest. But ultimately, the discretion is not yours. <laughs> the discretion is hers, and hers alone. Right? The only test, as a matter of law, as far as I'm concerned, is whether or not the reasons that are advanced are rational. Are they rationally connected to the interests of the Republic of South Africa? Again, I emphasize, you don't have to agree with those reasons. Right? You don't have to agree with those reasons. But you don't have to make that difficult decision either. And she has said, uh, um, um, uh, as Professor Foyun mentioned, that she agonized over this decision. You and me can sit nicely here and sort of argue and hypothesize. She's got to make that decision. Right? That's the burden. And the, the reason she, and not you, not you, not me, has a discretion is that ultimately she bears that burden. She alone bears that burden. You've seen the reasons that she's advanced. Right? They are the reasons that broadly fall into what uh, Thompson referred to as comedy. I don't think it's comedy. It's, these are the reasons that I'm taking into account in the interest of the Republic. It would damage our relations with our neighbor. Right? It's not because we like them. You should, I'm sure you've seen the spats between <laughs> Robert Mugabe. It's not because we like them, but we do have a relationship with them. Right? We do have to relate with them. We do have investments there. We do have people. These are things that she must take into account. You don't have to, because if something goes bad, if the government of Zimbabwe decides that they're going, you don't have to deal with those consequences. She must. That's why she has the discretion. She has to take into account that at the time all of this is happening, something that's very important for South Africa, the hosting of the SADC summit, is taking place. She's got to, take the, she's got to ask herself, what will be the consequence if in the, in the midst of a summit, the spouse of one of the attendees <coughs> Is arrested. Would that not collapse the summit? Right. One minute. Right. So that's that's. These are the things that she has to take into account. The thing of the derivative immunity is something that she again took into account. She has to take into account the fact that hey, there is this principle on in international law. I'll stop there. For now, we invite you, who I'm sure all came here with views that may have or may not have changed in the interim, to pose any questions for clarification or make your points to any of the. Uh, panelists at this point, so you're most welcome. Please. The two sides of the debate seem to be coming from slightly different perspectives. Thompson talking about a, an immunity that was recognized and uh, Dere talking about a, an immunity that was granted. And so I'm just asking a question for information really about the immunity that was granted, uh, about whether it's an enduring immunity or whether it was only granted for that particular set of circumstances and were um, Dr. Grace Mugabe now to visit uh, unaccompanied in the future, would that um, granted immunity status be subject to withdrawal and then the more debated status of whether she had an enduring derivative immunity become contested again? My view as an international lawyer is that the derivative immunity part applies only when she's traveling with the spouse. That's one. And two, it is not dependent on the minister's exercise. So in other words, even if the minister hadn't done the Section 72, she would still have it. Now, I think the difficulty would then be you have to argue this case and that becomes a little too. Um, so, so at least as far as that particular principle is concerned, I don't think there's a, there's a, uh, a debate as to its enduring nature. Uh, with respect to, to what actually happened here, the conferment um, of the immunity um, I don't know because the minute is silent, and I'm not quite sure how to interpret that. I just wanted to ask Prof. Ladi, and this is more practical than it is theoretical or prescriptive, even you. Um, I'm looking at Gabriel Angels. I hope I pronounced his surname correctly. After what happened to her, does she owe South Africa as a nation any level of in any measure of loyalty or patriotism. Because I feel, to, I feel that somewhat South Africa created its own monster, or back in the day during liberation struggles, this would be surely a way of creating your own sellout. 
in the sense that now she wasn't protected. If later on, when she's an adult, growing up and something is needed from her, or which again touches on her loyalty and patriotism, <coughs> can South Africa see itself getting that from her? considering what she's gone through now. I'm not going to get into all of these things about the kind of person Grace Mugabe is because I think it's, it's again, irrelevant for the function of the foreign minister. Um, that particular issue that you raised though is not irrelevant. And in fact, in her reasons, um, which were conveyed in the press statement, the press statement by, by, our, by, uh, by, by the press officer, Mr. Muniela, um, she says that she took that into account. She took the position of the individual into account. It was an important factor to take into account, but it's not the only factor. I also just want to say this about immunities as a broad principle. This is not about Gabriella Angles. You are, all of you, everyone is talking about their concern for Gabriella Angles. But that's not really what it's about. If somebody, if some other diplomat had done this, to the same person, there wouldn't be this concern. I don't like immunity. I, I know I'm known as a defender of immunity, but my position is the following. Once you've accepted something as a legal rule, you have to accept its consequences. Now, it's not the, uh, um, it's not the population that has accepted it, it's the states that have accepted it. In fact, since you referred to, to my ILC, you can look at our debates in ILC. I am consistently arguing for the minimization of immunity. But until such time as I get that right, the law is what it is, whether we like it or not. Gabriela Engels is not the only person to have suffered at the hands of people with immunity. Right? And in fact, it's not only South Africans, it's even South Africans abroad who have immunity who escape. That is the nature of things. It's unfortunate, but that's just simply how it is. If you don't like immunity, you have to start putting pressure on your government, all the governments, that when they interact at the UN and they see these debates on the ILC, they must fall on the side of reducing immunity. Don't just want to stress immunity when it comes to an issue that you feel strongly about, because then you don't have my support. If you're talking broadly about let's reduce this animal called immunity, you've got my support. But not in individual cases that are high profile because you want to get at one particular person be it Grace Mugabe, be it Al-Bashir, it should be a broad thing where we say, we are starting an action to change the law, not to apply the law differently because we don't like a particular person. That I will not be a party to. So my interest is in the law, and this is what the law permits. Uh, for whose benefit is international law? Is it intended to benefit the states alone, or both states and individuals. If it's intended to, to benefit both, why is that in this whole equation of immunity, emphasis appears to be on the states alone? Does the in, in, individual have the right to justice, maybe? I generally don't engage in philosophical debates about who international law is entitled or is intended to protect. My only, my only interest is what is international law? What is the content of international law? Um, and I think in this instance, international law is what it is. I think I would just want to again reiterate uh, in reply three points. To start with, uh, I am not convinced, unfortunately, especially with Prof. Charge's response in reference to uh, the specific legislation which is relevant to this particular matter, the SADIC protocol, which talks about immunities. And that SADIC protocol in section 62, which shows that Zimbabwe had an obligation which it failed. So, in other words, what Prof. Flood will be suggesting is supporting Zimbabwe in its failure of its international obligation. In other words, if there is an obligation to waive, it means that immunity didn't exist. For that reason, or specifically for that particular meeting, the immunity didn't exist, and yet the South African government uh, uh, granted it. So, Prof. Flood's uh, restraining would say, I'm not going to comment on the subject protocol. I find it as a, you know, it's, it's the law. Which, which, which was applicable to that particular summit, to say you don't comment on it because South Africa is not part of it, for me it's not a convincing argument. Then on the issue of state practice, I wondered actually, to be honest, if uh, Prof. Lad was being sincere to say state practice is, is consistent when you're talking of uh, uh, 
immunity that is forwarded to, to, uh, to spouses of Labour State. It's not. His own organization, which is member to the International Law Commission, which considers state practice, has stated in various reports, not, no, no, not, not in unclear terms, to say that as far as immunity which is granted to family members of heads of state, is, there is no international law supporting it, but it's a matter of committee. The reason which I then resorted to commenting on the aspect of committee, which again he chose to say, I will not comment on this issue, but that's precisely what the arguments he, which he been making to say, uh, the minister considered you know, the relationship between uh, Zimbabwe and uh, that's committee. And there are case law, the, the cases which have actually been decided where courts have commented on that aspect, especially vis-a-vis -vis in the global age, where there are now other important aspects, especially in the national human rights law. Now, I go now to the point which he's been reiterating to say, he says he likes the law, which is a very good uh, point to say international law is all about the law. But to say that the law is, it is what it is, it's not what it is. What South Africa is saying the law is, it's not what it is. That, that, that's not the position of international law. That's actually where the argument is coming to say, under customary international law, there is, uh, there, is no, uh, uh, there is no certainty to say that state practice is consistent in that particular regard. So, with that said, I will just reiterate what Zimba was saying to say, when, she, when you made a very good point that she's the one who has got the burden of making uh, the decision. But that decision should be a correct one. And also in that regard, to say that your argument sounded as if when you're saying it's her discretion, you're sounding as if uh, Section 72 of the uh, South African Diplomatic Act and Privilege creates a new form of immunity where, which can be granted without being granted in other in the law that governs immunity. It's not like that. In my view, the discretion should be exercised within the confines of already immunities which exist. You, it's not a creation of new form of immunity. So when she's saying I'm uh, exercising that discretion, it should be within the bounds of the immunity that already exists. And in this particular circumstance, my question which remains is what is that immunity? It can't be derivative from the set of immunity of, 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 because under international law, there is no such immunity. The only relevant uh, part in this particular circumstance is the SADC protocol, which say there was an obligation, and South Africa actually knows of this obligation, but it's, uh, you, yourself, I think you even cited that, that uh, OAU protocol in the, the cases of Al-Bashir, albeit not citing uh, Article 5.4, which says there is an obligation actually to waive immunity if its purpose is to benefit an individual in the defeat of course of justice. I think that will be my conclusions. So I'll take the four points that you raised in turn. The first with respect to the SADC protocol. Uh, one, you're wrong when you say it's applicable. I mean, just as a technical matter, it's not applicable because one of the parties is not party to it. So because South Africa is not a, because a treaty is only applicable if the state to which you want to apply it is a party to it. And by your own uh, The SADC protocol is not applicable to South Africa. It might be relevant to the facts and circumstances, but it is not applicable to South Africa. Yes, so, right, so I'm saying to you that you're wrong when you say the treaty that is applicable is a SADC protocol because it's not applicable. You said it's applicable, it's not applicable. Um, that's the first point. But the second point is that even if it were applicable, I mean, even if we were to take this Article 6.2 of those, Article 6.2 imposes an obligation on Zimbabwe. It does not give a right to South Africa to ignore the immunities. If we were to take your approach, then it would mean that essentially, as between SADC states, heads of state immunity, even ignoring this derivative spousal immunity, only applies to official acts. Because it is only in that context that you can say it's for personal use and not for, right? And I don't think that that's what the protocol does. The protocol imposes an obligation. So if Zimbabwe doesn't waive immunity consistent with the protocol, assuming that they owe that obligation to South Africa, and by the way, they don't, but assuming that they did owe that obligation to South Africa, right? Then there would be an obligation on Zimbabwe to waive it. Failure to do so, failure to do so would result in state responsibility. I mean, that's basically the structure of international law. There's an obligation. You must act according to that obligation. If you don't, it raises issues of state responsibility. But a consequence 
of failure to act in terms of your obligation is not that another state is free to violate your right. I mean, that's not the structure of international law. Um, secondly, you, you make this constant argument about derivative immunity and how it's not recognized under custom international law. Again, you don't advance a single evidence no, of practice. No, 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 you, you, no, 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 the wife of no, no, no. Oh, oh, What were the facts? You have to give the fact. Hang on, hang on. So, 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 in this instance, was she traveling with Mobutu, and was he at the time uh, the head of state in which state? I mean, that's really the critical question. If she remember the the circumscription, the scope of this derivative immunity, it is if you're a spouse of a head of of a serving head of state, and you are traveling with that head of state. I mean, that's the. If it falls within this. I'd really like to hear the state. So uh, I, don't that I, I just uh, have a sense that perhaps, you know, <laughs> I, will, I, will, I, will relate, I will organize then maybe just in a, a, like a rebuttal. Yeah. So rather than engage in a conversation, there will be a moment of rebuttal at the end. Thank you. Uh, and then the final point is, well, it's not the final point, actually, on the same second point, on the lack of practice, you refer to ILC reports. There are no ILC reports that say that. There might well be reports of special rapporteurs that say that. But there are no international law commission. So you know how the international law commission works. The special rapporteur drafts something. It's his view. It's his or her view. Ultimately, the international law commission considers this. The final consideration, the final product, is that of the commission. There is no single, absolutely sure of this, no single ILC report. There might well be reports of special rapporteurs that say many things, right? but there's no report of the international law commission itself. A report by a special rapporteur is just like an article. I mean, I've, I'm busy writing one now, by myself, without consulting anyone, and I can put whatever I want in it. There is no International Law Commission report that says what you say the International Law Commission has said. Um, then on section seven, oh yeah, so you base your whole international law arguments on your view, but again, if you look at practice, I, mean, I think the, the weight of practice um, is that there is this kind of derivative immunity. Your view of Section 7.2, you're, you're absolutely right to say that it's, it's your view, but the content of Section 7.2 is different. The content of Section 7.2 doesn't say, doesn't say immunity can only be conferred if it is one of the immunities that are recognized there. Nowhere does it say that, and in fact it wouldn't make sense for it to say that because the immunity would already be there. Section 7.2 is a, a, a safety net, a failsafe, to say if any of these don't apply, but the minister is of the view that it is in the interest of the republic for there to be immunity, then we grant it. Otherwise, you wouldn't need Section 72. Then you just simply apply already in the Act. I mean, it's a very short Act, right? Um, and the types of immunities there are specifically identified. So if Section 72 is meant merely to say, you know, you can apply one of these others, then it's not clear what it's doing there because you don't need it. I mean, it's a specific case to say, in any instance, that's not covered by any of these. The Minister for Foreign Affairs may, if it is in the interest of the Republic, confer immunity. I, I think, uh, for the sake of not repeating myself, for what I've already said, on the issue, just on the issue of Section 72, uh, I think I'll be very hasty. My understanding of Section 72, as I also say that my understanding, is to say that in case, for example, where someone may, uh, who is entitled to immunity in the first place, might find themselves in South Africa, but not, for example, on the list of uh, the, the, the department, and then that discretion may be exercised. What I, what I mean when I say, uh, it can, unless, is it your suggestion that you're saying Section 72 is constructing a new kind of immunity that doesn't exist even in the national law? Which the minister, you know, at your own discretion, whether it doesn't find support in the national law, she can just grant that immunity as long as it's in the interest of South Africa? Is, well, is, that, is that what you're suggesting? As long as you understand uh, that if it is in the interest of the Republic, then yes. Then I think <laughs> 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 on that point probably that's where we will completely I thank um, Dr. Chengeta, I thank uh, Professor Claudi for making themselves available. <laughs>